Welcome back to another episode of Faces of Our Cities. My name is Jesse. Today, we're going to be talking with Nico Barber. Uh, now, Nico uh, and I went to high school together. Uh, we went to this little boarding school in the middle of nowhere in Wisconsin. And without getting into too much of it, this was a pretty uh, conservative uh, Christian high school um, where, you know, we like had chapel every single day and we had study hall. We didn't have uniforms, thank goodness, because I don't know about you, but I'm pretty sure I never would have made it through with uniforms. Uh, I would have gotten like sent back to the room uh, every day for a messy uniform. Yes. <laughs> you were a better dress than I was though. So like maybe you would have like taken care of taking care of that. But um we met back when we were 14 years old and you were coming from California? Uh then? Utah. Where in you Utah. Come? Utah. You came from Utah and I was coming from Japan. And so um right. it was just yeah. this crazy place in the middle of Wisconsin where these kids from all over the the country and the world were like coming together. And, uh, and we, we hung out there for more or less four years. And, and then after high school, I mean, we pretty much went our separate ways. We, we, we were talking about this just before this, that, um, we really didn't have, we weren't in the like close friend group. We were in like that outer friend group. And so like, I remember yeah. thinking like that, that would probably be one of the last times I ever saw you just because <laughs> we were going separate routes and, and we were never like, like BFFs in that sense, like mostly because I only had one BFF or two BFFs. I better be careful. Phil Jar <laughs> uh, might listen to this uh, and Timmy Knight, right? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> and so, um, yeah, we moved on. And then the last time I saw you was uh, again in Portland, Oregon, uh, gosh, maybe four years ago now. And yeah. I was, yeah. tra I think it was about four years ago, because I was traveling through uh, the country working on a documentary, and I ran into your sister in like Montana or something like that. Very random. It was one of these, <laughs> it's just, I guess that's part of like the the world when you belong to a church body or have family members that belong to like a larger church body, uh, you end up traveling through the country and like meeting these people. And like my sisters have made their impression on, on the Christian church that like we're part of. Right. So like I walk into a church and they're like, oh, you must be a heap. You look like just like one of your <laughs> sisters. And then they name one of my sisters off, right? Yeah. And I'm like, oh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I know. And uh, but it, that's how it ended up working out. And your sister was like, yeah, you know, he goes in in uh, Portland. And I was like, oh, I'm headed there. And we got brunch. And that's the last that's the that was the last time we talked. And it was such a weird experience. It was so random. So, yeah. I remember when she texted yeah. me about that. I was so excited to to see you and and because uh, yeah, like you said, it was kind of one of those things. Just you know, always enjoyed hanging out with you when we did in high school, but it was you know didn't expect to get the opportunity to do that again. So glad uh, glad we're right. able to reconnect. Me too. I I want to share this one memory I have with you, and if after this I share this, you're like, don't ever let that go live. You can take it out. <laughs> Or you can tell me to take it out. But one of my my fondest memories uh, with you, Nico, was that our senior year of high school, for during the homecoming, we planned this like homecoming thing for in the That's auditorium, <laughs> and, we, and okay, and so like I wasn't playing football, you weren't playing football. We were just kind of whatever, like. A, a group of like rebels. We also used to be in that Phoenix line where we would take off our shirts during football games <laughs> and write our mascots letter on our chest. I have a picture and you're in it. And so like, I know you can't deny it. I can <laughs> around someplace in Wisconsin. It's hiding in a storage unit. In the freezing but cold Wisconsin I, falls. And <laughs> yeah. And what I remember is 
but I remember um, we had we had this idea that we were going to swing from the rafters in the auditorium onto stage during "Let the Bodies Hit the Floor," <laughs> and. <laughs> You can tell me if my memory's off, but I'm like, no, I'm pretty, no, I'm actually right. really positive this happened. And we had like the timpanies. Yeah, and we were banging like, on the timpanies the and then drums. like all the football players came in, like, didn't they rappel down from the rafters after that and joined us on stage? So, they did. So like <laughs> they rappelled, but you and I swung in <laughs> from the sides on ropes. And I remember almost hitting you and... And I remember thinking, I can't believe we got them to let us do this. But you were the reason that we got it approved. Because we went to the dean's house, if I remember, like the day before. And we were like, we got this idea and it's going to be amazing. And and I was not a good student. I was not to be <laughs> trusted whatsoever. And so he just like looked at me and was like, yeah, what's Nico going to say? Like, <laughs> should I, I don't trust you, Jesse, at all, but Nico, like, what's up? And you were like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I rock climb, and, like, I totally know how to do this. It's definitely safe. I've already got it figured out. And I was like, yeah, he's which, got it. Which wasn't true at all. <laughs> Just, like, I got a rope <laughs> I'm going to tie up. <laughs> I think we, like, I don't even, I think maybe we tested it out one time. I don't even know yeah. if we did because I was so terrified. But it went off so, flawlessly. <laughs> I, I'm glad that you say that because in my head, I kind of think it was a lot more amazing than I give it credit for. No, I, I thought about, I would cool. really, I wish someone, it was like the days when people had cell phones and were getting videos. So I would love a video of that because it was pretty. <laughs> Thank you. I think so too. Yeah. Pretty daring. To this day, that we did I've it never and... heard of anyone <laughs> trying that. So, um, that, yeah, one of my my favorite memories from high school with you was was that whole experience and yeah. and how cool it was. Um, <laughs> we were such rebels. Such yeah. rebels. So, Planning anyway, that. well, let's <laughs> now that like our audience is totally bored uh, by <laughs> us reminiscing about um our high school and our experiences there why can you give me and in our audience a breakdown of what happened after high school like uh and you don't have to go into like all the details but essentially like i mean you went and became a lawyer right yeah yeah um so after high school went to college um uh majored in political science which like every lawyer does <laughs> um and uh took a year off and um after that did a fellowship out in um dc and stayed out there for law school kind of knowing that i wanted to come back to the west coast eventually but um you know for a little political junkie fresh out of college that was kind of you know the the mecca to, to go work and, and go to law school there so um yeah did that graduated in boy, 2013, which now was making me feel really old. So I've been practicing for about eight and a half years now. And what kind of law are you, have you been practicing? Because when I look at your LinkedIn, it seems, am I right in thinking mostly corporate law? Yeah. Yeah. Corporate law. So, um, I went into private practice at a firm called Sidley Austin initially in their Los Angeles office, um, in their corporate group. And, and that's just kind of a you know, when you say corporate law, there's a lot of different facets of that, but um, I've kind of touched a number of things throughout a, a corporation's life, you know, whether it's, you know, forming and helping startup companies um, form their their entities, uh, form their corporations, raise capital from venture capital funds um, to uh, public company mergers, to initial public offerings. Um, most of my focus is on the mergers and acquisition side of things. So, um, you know, if it's a tech company, you know, I, I practice in California, I should um, preface this. So, you know, everybody is a tech company out here, it seems like. So um, I do a lot of <laughs> you work. You have to be if you want to ever get bought out, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So <laughs> no one's buying bakeries out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And there's, I mean, there's a lot of money flowing into these tech companies. So, 
Um, I do a lot of work uh, in tech, um, primarily on the venture capital side. So when they're investing in uh, tech startups, um, I'll help with those investment documents, um, help the venture capital funds form their funds, raise money for their funds and, and do due diligence on companies. And then um, I also, so that's probably about 50% of my practice um, is on the investment fund side. And then the other part of my practice is in mergers and acquisitions and that in, for California, it, it tends to be a lot of uh, sell side, you know, companies that are selling to get um, liquidity for their founders and, and their and their venture capital backers. Um, but sometimes on the buy side as well. You uh, had mentioned that you're you're mostly virtual or com completely virtual right now. How is I'm just kind of curious how that has just changed the work that you do. Um, normally, I don't care about this, but like I guess I always assume that like people expected lawyers to like come in and sit in the boardroom, and like there is when you're dealing with with negotiations like that. There's there's a lot of value to being able to be right front and center with somebody, but are you, uh, are you, do you find it difficult to be able to do your job now remotely or is it just easier than ever? What, what are we um, dealing You know, it, I, the transition hasn't been too bad, actually. The, um, there are times where it is really valuable um, to, to be in person, to be in a, in a large boardroom or a conference room, just to hammer out especially when you're getting close to a closing to kind of hammer out final negotiations. But ever since the financial crisis, that face to face um, is, is kind of receded. Uh, part of that is just companies are looking to save money and they don't want to fly everybody out to New York City to a boardroom just to do something that can be done over the phone. So a lot of my practice leading up to COVID and, and the pandemic and lockdowns was over the phone. Um, you know, a lot of my clients were, you know, international clients. And so we would never see them anyways. I had to build a relationship with them over email and over the phone. And uh, the folks that I was negotiating against, you know, the lawyers opposite me on the deal. Um, you know, a lot of them were out of, you know, firms, New York office or London office. And so it was mostly over the phone. So I, I kind of joked when everything went uh, remote that it wasn't that much of a change because usually I would just go into the office and shut my door and crank out, you know, whatever document I was working on. Um, you know, I, th I think the one downside is more of, you know, professional development. Um, I lucked out that I was about a seventh year associate by the time lockdown happened. So, you know, for the legal practice, a lot of it is mentorship and you, you kind of learn by being in the room with the senior associates and the partners and kind of watching them do their thing. Um, I think that would be hard as a junior associate coming into practice right now, not having that face to face and being able to, you know, when you're scared because a partner just yelled at you, go talk to another associate in the office next door. Um, but I kind of really lucked out being at the the kind of level I was in where I, I had already had that experience and that mentorship and guidance that I was able to kind of, I think, although maybe my clients and partners disagree, uh, seamlessly kind of transition to the, to the remote side of things. Sure. Sure. Um, and let's see, so you're an associate attorney now, right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. And I guess for a layman like myself, what does that, like, what does that level look like? Is that associate is just before becoming a partner, uh, or are there, or there's senior and then there's partner and what does that look like? Yeah. So usually at a, at a firm, um, it, I don't know how it works outside of the corporate firms, but if you're practicing in corporate law, you kind of go to a firm and it's about a 10 year track before you're up for partner and you're an associate. Um, there's, and then, you know, within the firm, you kind of talk about junior and mid-level and senior associates. So I'm at the senior associate level. So, um, what that means is that I get, I get a boss around the junior associates <laughs> um, uh, and a senior associate really kind of the, the role is um, at least in deal world where, where I work, you know, I, um, it, it's kind of playing quarterback essentially. So it's, it's taking guidance from the partners who are more high level 
um, and doing a lot of the, the drafting of the documents, maybe handling some of the negotiations, um, and then kind of pushing work down and um, to the junior associates, um, kind of some of the more grunt work that, uh, you know, I did when I was a junior associate and then kind of managing deal flow. So it's a lot of project management. So, if, you know, if, if it's a public company merger, especially you've got a lot of lawyers on each side, you know, upwards of 25 to 30 lawyers that are touching every merger agreement um, in some capacity. So the senior associates role is kind of playing the quarterback and, and making sure that everything is moving along, uh, hopefully expeditiously, but uh um, yeah, you know, that, that's that, that, um, you talk about like that, like there could be that many lawyers involved in, in a merger, right. Or an acquisition like that. That's, uh, to someone like me, who's really just never even dabbled in that world, but you just either like your only knowledge of it is either from hearing people talk about having a friend who's in it or seeing it on television. Right. <laughs> the first thing, like a lay person like me would say is like how in the world do you need that many people right like <laughs> what in the world are they just like first of all i never should have been a creative i should have figured out how to do that because look everyone just gets to pay gets a payday but <laughs> help me understand like for like a layperson like that like why do you need that many lawyers on on like a deal yeah, so I mean, it, it it varies on the size of the deal, right? So if it's a if it's a small tech company that's selling, um, in its early stages, you you wouldn't need that many. Um, if it's a large international company that's selling, um, you know, these these companies are are huge, and and a, a, a acquisition could be you know a couple billion dollars to the tens of billions of dollars, and they may be financed um by cash or by debt um so the the answer to your the short answer to your question is expertise so there's always there's these huge companies that have a lot of different um aspects to them employment issues uh intellectual property there may be some trade issues um if if they uh you know if it's a company based out of china that's um, there's import export restrictions, um, antitrust issues. Um, so there's so many different, uh, practice areas and, and legislation, both in the United States and in all the jurisdictions in which the company has offices and, and operations that, uh, need to be sorted out for the, the transaction to take place. And so no one lawyer has that much knowledge on that many different things. So you just have to bring everybody to the table and kind of make sure. And it's not as a, as the deal lawyer, the, the, um, corporate side, I don't know anything about, you know, I know enough to be dangerous about tax, um, or employment law, but you really need the experts to come in and, and tell me what I need to kind of be, um, concerned about Looking from for the, the deal side. Sure. Sure. And, um, I mean, that's, it's, uh, relating it to my work, right. As a producer director, like that makes total sense to me. Right. Like I know enough about everyone's role to ask some of the right questions, but I really like rely on like each individual person to be an expert in their own field. Yeah. I'm curious, yeah. you know, as an, as how that works from, uh, as from an attorney standpoint, um, I, I think about um like when it comes to um uh, the medical industry um or healthcare mm -hmm. industry rather uh how doctors will like have a chance to get into their specialty and then at the very beginning like through their residency and like whatever they get like they're more or less like stuck in that like route and headed straight for it and like that's you're not you're not veering off and like learning multiple things like for an attorney like is it for you guys, is it like, hey, whatever, like, senior uh, associate or, like, partner I managed to, like, convince to let me, like, intern under, like, that's what I'm going to learn how to do, and, and that's it. Like, or is there ability to become a specialist in multiple areas? Like, how does that work for you guys? Yeah, it's, that's a good question. It It's, um, you know, the, the age of being a generalist is, is kind of over in, in the legal field, at, at least that's. Kind of what I was told when I 
came up the ranks. Um, usually the, the way it happens, if you join a firm and do kind of the, go the private practice route, um, it varies from firm to firm, but, um, you know, when, when you first start, they'll, they'll kind of let you dabble a little bit in all the different practice groups and kind of get a sense of, you know, what you're interested in. And then if there's a need for an associate in that group, um, uh, so usually it, it, it's not too hard to kind of find a niche that you, you may be interested in. Um, but then, you know, the risk is that, you know, two, three years in, if, you find out you want to switch it, it, it could be a little bit harder. Um, I, I made that jump. Um, I originally started in corporate reorganization, which is when a company goes under, um, restructuring their debts and, and, um, kind of getting them through the bankruptcy process. And then about two years into my practice, I switched to, uh, mergers and acquisitions. And, and so it's, it's doable, but you kind of, um, you, you kind of need to prove that you're going to hit the ground running and, um, you know, uh, make up for those, those, that lost time, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Cause it's not necessarily, even though it's great experience, it's not necessarily transferable, right? You're, you're still like coming in kind of a, as a newbie, even though you got three years under your belt. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, the law is always evolving and markets are changing, you know, like now every corporate lawyer I know is trying to turn themselves into a cryptocurrency expert. So, you know, um, you know, that's, that's a fun part of the job is that you kind of, you know, as things change, you need to, you need to keep up with it. So you, you do you kind of have to reinvent yourself and, and stay on top of things. So, so there is some flexibility there too. Have you, yeah, I got to ask, have you, uh, have you taken that leap into becoming a crypto lawyer? Is it, is that an interest of yours? It's, you know, I, I find it fascinating just conceptually the whole concept of cryptocurrencies and, um, you know, in the legal space, it's, it's kind of a wild, wild west from a regulatory standpoint, because our regulations just haven't kept up with them, uh, with, with the innovation that's happening. So, um, I've tried to start dabbling and, and, uh, um, purely just out of, you know, the, the interest in, in kind of the legal side of it. Uh, but, um, you know, I, I, I'd be lying if I said I understood the underlying technology. Wouldn't, you know, I was going to say, it's wouldn't, over my head. wouldn't, wouldn't take a, <clears throat> wouldn't necessarily be ready to be hired to, uh, litigate some, some crypto mess. No, no, so, not at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so, well, a, a big part of this podcast is to try to bring uh, a couple of, of takeaways and tidbits, maybe some life hacks or some business hacks for our audience members. Now, being a corporate lawyer and and knowing that a lot of the people that we've interviewed for this podcast have been entrepreneurs, or business owners, or, or some level of, of exec, um, are there any tidbits of information from, I guess, a, a professional standpoint that you're willing to offer up, whether that be, you know, these are some questions that you're willing that you should ask, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're starting to look for uh, um, a, a, a lawyer to help you with an merger or acquisition, or, uh, hey, I've seen this happen before, just never let this happen. <laughs> or like, have you de dealt with a lot of deals where it's like best friends are like splitting their company up and you're like, whatever you do, don't go into business with your best friend. Like, <laughs> what, 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 what can you give us from your, your years of experience as a corporate lawyer? that you're willing to share with us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think the first one that I, I run into a lot in the tech world, especially, um, is <laughs> no one, especially when you're bootstrapping your company and you've got all sorts of expenses, the last thing you want to do is pay for a lawyer. And I get it. Um, <laughs> you know, legal expenses are, are, you know, they're, they're not cheap. And, um, but, I, I can't tell you how many times I've run into um, this. The, the adage I always say is, is, uh, is an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. It costs a lot more money to hire lawyers to fix a problem than it does to hire them to make sure you do things right in the first place. 
Um, and, and you see that with, with tech companies a lot because, um, you know, the tech world is moving fast and breaking things and, um, you know, they, it's super competitive and then they need to keep things going at, a, you know, at a rapid clip. And, you know, the last thing they're thinking about is making sure their corporate documents are up to snuff or that, you know, every document signed or that, um, you know, they're complying a hundred percent with X area of law. And then when that comes time to bring in some institutional money, whether it's from a venture capital firm or a private equity firm, or maybe they're being bought out by a, a competitor, um, that could take a lot of money off the table if they, if their ducks aren't in a row, if, if they weren't um, doing things by the books. Uh, Cause once the, the institutional money comes in, they're looking for any excuse to drop the asking price. Right. So, you know, I, I think there are ways to, you know, find good counsel at, at whatever stage of a company you're at that meets your budget. And so that would be something I, I would say, um, you know, make sure you, you've got your ducks in a row. And, and even though you may have to, you know, bite the bullet and, and pay out some money to, to hire a lawyer earlier than you would want, um, it's probably worth it down the road. If you're a company that's looking to grow and, and eventually sell, sell or get an investment um, as part of your exit. I think that's that's really helpful. I mean, the big takeaway is get a lawyer involved before before it's too late. And um, I guess any any suggestions on on finding a lawyer or on choosing a lawyer? Like, I mean, most people like me would be like, I don't know, I get along with them. Uh, <laughs> but like, <laughs> he seems nice. He's not a total like douche to me. Um, yeah. <laughs> and that would be like a like a huge thing for me. Um, but uh, like, what I mean, what would you say uh, when someone's looking for it? Or like, if I came to you and I was like. Nico, like I need, I need a lawyer to review my documents. And you're like, A, not me. I don't have time for you, Jesse. But then I'd be like, well, who should, how do I find one? Like, what would you suggest to me? Yeah. Um, I think referrals, word of mouth is, you know, there, there's a lot of lawyers out there. There's a lot of law firms and it's really hard to, to differentiate between them, especially if you're not a lawyer and, and in the legal field, um, you know, you don't know what firms are which and what practice areas which. Um, so I I always suggest if you have a friend that's a lawyer and you're looking to hire a lawyer for whatever reason it is, um, talk to your friend, talk to, you know, check your network and reach out. And, you know, if it's, you know, if, if you were coming to me with a, you know, if you're hiring an employee and had an employment law question, I would tell you, I have no idea what to do about this. But I know five different employment lawyers, and and I think that's usually your best bet because, um, uh, you know, for most lawyers, uh, their their bread and butter is is their reputation, right? And and so, you'll be able to find a good lawyer based on whether or not, um, you know, people are referring referring work to to him or her. So, I would reach out to your network and see who you know, and and go from there. Got it. Okay. Well, hey, that, I think that's good advice. Uh, it's not advice I like hearing as an advertising exec, uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I should like be better at pitching lawyers, myself. Like, no, come to me. Like, I'm the hey, lawyer let's... you need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, hey, there you go. Like, if you're listening to this and and you don't have a lawyer friend, you can you can reach out to Nico on LinkedIn and and say, hey, I listened to that Faces of Our Cities podcast and you and Jesse went to high school together and Jesse is my connection on LinkedIn, but he's never talked to me before. Uh, <laughs> who should I use? And you'll be, and they should be able to trust you. There you go. Now they, now they know that you're a trusted resource. I got you. You'll back. be like, okay, I need to start paying for this, getting paid for this. <laughs> Like Jesse, just, like divorce, like cases just start coming your way, and you're like, "What? Like, why am I getting this?" So I do not know maritime law, Jesse. <laughs> yeah, hey, that's a big deal down here, all right, in Houston. All right, I got, I got one of those. I know one. All right, so we're good there. We're good there. God, I hope I never actually have to deal with that. But anyway, well, Nico, thank you so much uh, for taking time. I know I took a little bit extra of it, um, but thanks for that uh, that stroll down memory lane. And thanks for um, just 
uh, letting your your long locks of hair grace our presence. Uh, for those of, for those who are listening and not watching this, um, Nico's uh, picture on LinkedIn does not look anything like him. Uh, he is much more rad in person, and um, yeah, I can't wait till we get to actually like interact and in, in person together. I think uh, I think I might have to head out to Utah soon. Yeah, yeah, come visit anytime. And um, no, thanks for having me. This was this was a real treat. Uh, um, cool. Always good reconnecting. And um, yeah, you can find Nico on LinkedIn. Uh, his first name is spelled N I C C O L O. Uh, last name is Barber. Um, and uh, uh, reach out to him on there, and um, he might he might accept your friend request or your your connection request. <laughs> Seems like the type that would. Uh, and if not, just uh, mention that you uh, met him through this podcast and, and that should give you some street cred. So <laughs> thanks again. And uh, I can't wait to connect again in uh, who knows how long. All yeah. right. Likewise. Thanks, Jesse.